So today we're going to be uh, in the book of Matthew, continuing through Matthew's gospel. Uh, just as a reminder, if you're not familiar, as we talk about the gospels, we have four different gospels in the Bible, and each one is an eyewitness testimony to the life of Jesus and what happened in it. You guys will notice today, as we talk through this, at various points, I'll refer to the other gospels. I may not cite which one exactly, but, but we'll refer to the others. Um, each of these eyewitness testimonies, sometimes they'll cover different information than the other, so it can vary going through it. Um, that's part of what helps establish the legitimacy of this, as, as is often the case in our own lives. In fact, I was thinking just the other day, I, I sat down with a, a young married couple and asked them to tell the story of how they got engaged. And would you believe that the guy and the girl focused on different aspects of that? It's, uh, it, I mean, it's pretty common, but in our life, often two people will see the same thing and we might describe it differently. Um, that's the case with our Gospels, and so we can pick up little tidbits that way. The last time we met, we talked about the baptism of Jesus Christ and about uh, him being empowered by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit falling on him, and him being prepared for his ministry with that. And we talked about through that how each of us is called not just to be baptized into the faith, ultimately, but also to look at our lives and have times where we, we do a deep analysis and ask ourselves, are there things in my life right now that I need to repent of? Uh, and so Jesus leaves that, and today we're going to talk about uh, what's often referred to as the temptation of Jesus Christ. Actually, we'll see in the first verse of the chapter, it used the word that Jesus was tempted. I'll mention that in the Greek, that word can be tested as well, and I think that's, that's probably more appropriate because I don't think that God goes out of his way to force any of us to do anything in terms of temptation um, but sometimes he does allow us to be tested to see uh, really what we're made of and if we really are faithful to him as a way of finding out how, how much we need to improve. So um, let's take a moment and pray, and then I'll describe a few more details with this, and then we'll dive into our passage for the day. Uh, we'll be in chapter 4 of Matthew, and you're welcome to turn there in your Bibles if you like. Heavenly Father, as we study your word today, I pray that you'd push aside whatever distractions were here this week and that you would help us to come into your presence and that we would see you more clearly through what we read. Lord, this isn't just words on a page. It's, it's a message for us. And it'll make a difference if we absorb it. God, we thank you for this opportunity. And I pray that you, your spirit would be at work in each of us, convicting us when it's appropriate through this. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. How many of you guys have ever been through a time where you felt like you had really been tested or tried? Yeah, I bet that's happened, right? You know, I can't help but look back in my own life uh, to a time when I was in college, and it, some of you may not know this, but years ago, before I went into ministry, I was actually a, a biology pre-med major, and uh, I'd hoped to become a doctor someday. And, and, you know, I don't know exactly what happened leading to that. I was always good at math and science, and so I thought that's the direction I was supposed to go. But halfway through my junior year, really at the start of my junior year, I started feeling like I was way off track, like something was wrong in my life. And not just with my major, but with life in general. And it was strange because I, I would be going to classes and, and might be doing well in them, or I, would, uh, I had opportunities to present research and stuff like that and publish research. And all of these were big goals that, that were on my list. And you would have thought as I went through that, I'd have a lot of joy. But actually, I, I really sank into a season of depression. And I wasn't sure why. I didn't know what had happened in my life, if I'd gone astray in some way or if something was, was wrong. And so I started to try to ask myself, all right, what do you do now, Lloyd? You're halfway through your junior year. You've got a year and a half left of this. And, and yet, uh, honestly, I was at a place where I hated myself. I hated the people around me. And I just, I just wanted to run away from what I was doing, despite, in many cases, that, that things were going well, that there were some achievements that were on my list that I was actually accomplishing. And... It, in the midst of that, I took a step back and prayed, and I felt like God had led me to go to Boise Bible College. And initially, I thought, I'll go there for a semester, maybe two, and just try to recenter on God's Word and see if that'll get me in the right place. And it was interesting because at BBC, um, they really feed you God's Word through a fire hose. So you can, you can just about drown it, but you spend hours every day studying God's Word, digging into it. And, and it was a huge blessing to be able to do that. And as I walked through that, I felt like my life started to turn around a little bit, like I, I started to get out from under the cloud that had been hanging over my head, although I didn't know what was next, but, but I did know God would be in the middle of it. And that first summer at BBC, I went out, and God had put me in a position where I could get a job at a, at a Christian camp. I say God put me in a position. Actually, they had a recruiting booth at the school there, and I walked by, and I scoffed, and I said, yeah, right. And, uh, 
And then I felt convicted about 10 feet later that God was telling me, yeah, right. <laughs> and so I had to turn around and go talk to them. And I worked at this uh, camp for the summer. But at the camp, I spent 10 hours a day, six days a week, working, and I wasn't some big leader. I was just the guy going out. I'd make the campfire when they wanted. I'd scrub the, the cabins. I'd unclog the toilets. I'd, the exciting parts were I, I lifeguarded too, so I guess that was nice. But, um, but it wasn't super glamorous work, but it was a lot of serving other people. And the interesting part is that between spending that time deeply studying God's Word and spending time focusing not on myself but other people, my heart started to change. And I started to get to a point where I was healed and God began renewing me. And, and, you know, it was about six months after that, that God actually informed me that I was supposed to not go into medicine, but go into ministry. And so uh, that's been the calling I've had, but it was a very interesting turnaround point. And as we get together today, we're going to talk about a time of testing for Jesus. And I think sometimes we sort of brush over this section uh, because we've, we may have heard it before, but there's some big things happening here. And I have to point out, one of the biggest challenges that Jesus is going to face as he's tested out in the wilderness is that he already knows the ending. You know, when I was there struggling with depression, I didn't quite know what would happen next. But I could hope that it was good things. For Jesus' part, if his life goes according to plan, he's going to preach to a lot of people who don't really want to hear him for years on end. Many of them will try to kill him. And ultimately, three years later, they'll be successful to that end. They'll capture him. They'll crucify him and murder him for no crime that he's done. In fact, it'll be our crime. And Jesus must know all of that going into this as he, he's just been baptized. The spirit's fallen on him. Now he's being sent out into the wilderness and he's going to have this time of testing. And maybe the worst part is he knows the ending already. He knows where this is going. Sometimes, actually, ignorance might be the easier way to handle it. Sometimes it's easier not knowing what happens tomorrow. And sometimes we like to think we do, but if we're honest about it, we have no idea what the end of this day even holds. Um, so I want to point out a few trends before we get into this. Now, some of you may be familiar with this passage. Some of you may not. You will be by the time we're done. But there's a few stories in the Bible that are relevant to this one and that I think actually inform and even help fulfill what's happening here. And I want to talk about a few of those before we get to this passage, because we'll see parallels in it. The first is that you'll notice as we talk through this, that Jesus is going to be out fasting for 40 days in the wilderness. And you guys might remember that when the Israelites were brought through the wilderness, after God freed them through Moses uh, from Egypt and through the plagues that were sent upon them, they went out in the wilderness and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. A intriguing aspect of this is, of course, when the Israelites were done with that, they went to the land of Canaan. And God gave them this opportunity under his supernatural power to go into it, and they were scared. And they didn't want to go in. And so they had to go back out to the wilderness. So they went out and were tested, this whole nation. And unfortunately, they came up wanting at it. And even in that story, Moses himself, who is a great leader, and in fact, one of the most famous leaders in, in the entirety of the Bible and in the entirety of, of uh, following God and in the whole history of God, Moses even, in his... In his last years out in the wilderness, he has a moment with a moral lapse. He, he goes out and God tells him to draw water from a stone using God's miraculous power. He taps his staff against it and Moses claims credit for what happened. Moses makes a simple mess up and the result of that is that after 40 years out in the wilderness, Moses now can't go into the promised land. He misses out on what God has. And yet by contrast, we'll see Jesus doesn't do that. Things are different with him. It's almost like it's a, a repeat of that same thing, but the ending works out differently. And finally, when we talk about temptation, when we talk about being tested, one of the passages that may come to mind is the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. And intriguingly, the story of Adam and Eve in the garden is the story of how sin got into the world and started destroying everything. And the story of Jesus Christ is going to be the story of how God came into the world and put that to an end. Now, with Adam and Eve, we'll notice there were three basic core elements to how Eve was tested. And each one of these are going to be used on Jesus, actually. We read that when, G when Eve received the fruit, we often say it's an apple. We're not sure. Hebrew tradition said it was a pomegranate, but, um, but again, uncertain. But she receives this fruit. She looks at the fruit. It says it was pleasing to her eyes. It looked appealing. It looks nice. And she was hungry. She said it tasted good. And so she, her flesh desired it as well. And finally, with that piece of fruit, Satan gave Eve a lie and said, 
that were a partial lie and said, if you eat of that, then you won't really die. You'll actually become like God. You'll know good from evil. You'll have the kind of knowledge that God has. And so to Eve's pride, it also had this, this leading of like, okay, well, if I do this, then I could be like God. Wouldn't that be great to have God's kind of power, to have his kind of authority? And so those three temptations were used simultaneously. And under that, Adam and Eve collapsed. They ate of the fruit. They disobeyed God. They allowed sin into the world. And we still suffer the effects of that to this day. Uh, and yet, Jesus is going to have these exact same things happen. And as we'll see in a minute, he's actually going to come out of it okay. Which should raise a question, besides Jesus being God's son, how exactly does this happen? And I think there's a lot we can learn from what Jesus does. Because for all of us, we're going to go through times of testing. And today we're going to discuss some key truths about how we endure that without being destroyed. God actually has a way that we can walk through those valleys and he'll sustain us through to the other side. So we're in Matthew chapter 4. Uh, if you don't have your Bibles, we'll have it on the screen. You can follow along there. Uh, we'll begin with verses 1 through 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you were the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, this initial story is interesting because for years, many secular scholars or, or liberal scholars would read this and say, you know how we know the Bible isn't real? Well, it's stuff like this. Here, this starts off and it says right off the bat, Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and that just doesn't seem possible. Nobody could really do that. Now, a few things I want to say about that, just if you have a little skepticism about what that would look like. Um, first of all, I'll mention that in the Old Testament, we have recorded that both Moses and Elijah did the same thing at one point. So Jesus isn't actually the first person to do this. A few other very significant characters in the history of, of uh, salvation have done the same thing. The second thing I want to mention is a two-minute Google search on what the longest amount of time that somebody's fasted uh, will reveal that the Guinness Book of World Records holds that a gentleman uh, set the record here a few decades ago with 382 days of fasting. So now... I will say that gentleman was morbidly obese when he started and quite skinny when he stopped. So um, it was a very effective diet program, apparently. But that, that said, there are people who have gone hundreds of days without eating. And I will say that's not without its dangers. You do have to be very cautious after you've gone more than three or four days about how you reboot your digestive system. The science of this is kind of intriguing in that most scholars will say, actually, that after you've gone through the first two to three days of fasting the hunger pangs seem to reduce quite drastically, and your, your digestive system actually just goes to idle. To be clear, Jesus would have been drinking water during this time, but nothing else. Um, I'll say personally, I've made it four days before. I think the hardest part was just that I was constantly making food for my kids, and I felt like my body was telling me, you're insane, you're holding it right now, you should eat it. Um, but I have, I have personal mentors who have actually gone 40 days before without, without any food, and you could see their spinal column by the end of it. But it's perfectly possible to do so. Um, that said, it's not easy, right? Probably, I'm guessing nobody here is eager to just go up today and sign up for that journey and say, okay, 40 days, no problem. Count me in. Um, so getting past that initial skepticism, we see that Jesus is brought out into the wilderness. One of the other gospels actually mentions that he's out really just in the middle of nowhere with wild animals around him. And so... Uh, there, this is, there's nobody to see around there. I have to say, seeing the wild animals, I think that would be harder for me because I would probably look at them and see barbecue uh, and want to, you know, we could get that guy, I think, and, and grill him. Um, but Jesus is out there, and you'll notice it's 40 days and 40 nights before the devil even shows up. He has to go that huge period of time eating nothing, simply drinking water, and then Satan shows up. And at that point, no doubt, he would love to have a meal. And when Satan gets there in verse 3, he says, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Now, you notice here, what's interesting is, of course, the mere fact that Satan has come personally to tempt Jesus shows that Satan knows he's the Son of God. There's not a lot of question here about whether he has the knowledge of that. But his tone in this is very sarcastic. Oh, really, Jesus? 
Well, if you are the son of God and you really are this powerful, go ahead and take that stone and turn it into bread. Well, that, let me ask you a simple question. Could Jesus have actually done that? Yeah, certainly. It's within his power. Uh, this is Jesus through whom the universe was created. He probably could have made the bread out of nothing. He probably didn't need the rock anyway, but certainly he could take the stone and turn it into bread. Why wouldn't Jesus do it? Is an obvious question. And to answer that, I, I want to point out for a moment, when you look over the life of Jesus Christ and all the miracles he did, you'll notice he didn't do a whole lot for himself. I have to say, if I was in his position, I, I, I like to think I'm, I'm uh, really benevolent, but if I had the ability to make a prime rib sandwich out of thin air while I was fasting for 40 days, I think there'd be prime rib there in a moment. And yet, Jesus is able to deny himself. He has that ability, but one of the key characteristics of who Jesus is, is he does not use the miraculous power that God has given him simply as a parlor trick or to help himself. He'll use it repeatedly to help other people. His, his next three years of life is going to be filled with nonstop ministry interactions where he's constantly healing the lame, casting out demons, all kinds of things like that. So there's no question that Jesus actually has the power but he only uses his power for other people. And had he started using his power that way and getting five-star restaurant cuisine in his hands magically every night, it really would have changed who he was. For him to be the guy who's going to go and die on a cross for everybody else, this level of selflessness, selflessness needs to be part of who he is. And so we'll see Jesus responds to that by quoting scripture. The devils tested him, pressed him on this, and in verse 4, he says, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. In other words, food has its place, but actually God's word has a more important one. Jesus' idea here isn't that you should just never eat, of course. There is a place for that. But he knows he's been called by God to have this time of fasting and to draw close to God through it. And incidentally, from a spiritual standpoint, really, this is what fasting is about. It's about emptying yourself of the world and the concerns of the world and filling yourself with the spirit, with the things of God, spending time in his word, doing things like that. As you fast, what you're supposed to do is when you have those hunger pangs or that desire for food, you stop and rather than opening the refrigerator, you go to God's word and you spend time reading it or you come to God and you begin praying to him. And in that, you can start to reconcile who you really are and who God is. Now, this idea of emptying yourself of the world and filling yourself with the Spirit is kind of the opposite of what most of us like to do, isn't it? I mean, most of us, we see all kinds of shiny things around us. And we want to pursue them. And we want to trade, we'll trade our time off and we'll spend hundreds of hours in our week pursuing the world. And we give God just a little bit. Here, Jesus is demonstrating the opposite. If you want to draw close to God and make it through trial, self-denial needs to be a part of that journey. And fasting is, is one of the great ways to do that. But key point here, Jesus' first response is to rebuke the devil using Scripture. Let's go on then and pick up at verses 5 through 7 and see what happens next. <coughs> Excuse me. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you were the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Okay, so Satan is using some miraculous powers here, um, and he takes Jesus and he puts him up on the highest point of the temple. Now I'll mention there are scholars that have a lot of arguments about where the highest point on the temple is. And it depends on if you're counting from the temple to the ground or from the temple to the valley below. We don't have to get lost in all of that. The big principle here is Jesus is taken and he's brought up to the pinnacle of the temple. And interestingly, uh, something that we can find by reading documents around Jesus' life, is many of the Pharisees in Jesus' day actually expected that when the Messiah came, this isn't based on the scripture, but this is based on their expectation, that when the Messiah came, he would stand up on the top of the temple and that he would hover down to them. 
But that's how God would introduce the Messiah to the world. And so there was a, a popular tradition of men at the time that that would happen. And in effect, Satan's bringing him up there and saying, try it. Why don't you fulfill it, Jesus? And he even says, you know, even if you don't levitate yourself down there, well, he said he'd command his angels concerning you. They wouldn't let you strike your feet against the stone. Basically, God says he'll save you. So why don't you just jump and see how it works out? Now, here we have, whereas before we had the sin of the flesh coming in, where, where there was an appetite to be fed, kind of like with Adam and Eve. Now we have this uh, sin of pride where Jesus has this opportunity. And if he were to go from the highest point on the temple and levitate down into the crowds below, would their perception of him be different? Quite substantially, right? In fact, there would be people coming from all over to see this guy who could float through thin air and to try to figure out what was going on with him. So Jesus has this opportunity to do this, and yet he knows that's not what his life is supposed to be. He's not supposed to be an earthly king. And if that was his mission, it would make sense. But he's here to die for the sins of man, to change our hearts, to renew the integrity of mankind itself, and to give it new hope. And so this doesn't really fulfill it. Jesus, again, turns around and quotes another scripture. It says, you don't put the Lord your God to the test. Basically, would God rescue him? Well, probably. Could he even rescue himself? Well, yeah. But his role isn't to just try to see if he can do something stupid enough that doesn't actually have God rescue him. That's not his goal in that. It'd be kind of like if you felt like God had told you to go on a mission trip somewhere and you decided, well, since God called me there, I must be safe. So I'm going to take my car 100 miles an hour up a curvy road and, and hope that it all works out. Um, you may be okay, but, but you're probably tempting fate more than you should. Excuse me. Jesus sees that and isn't going to be duped by it. And again, at the beginning of, of Satan's accusation, we see that he asks that question. Well, if you really are the Messiah, if you really are, he pushes it more. So let's look at the third temptation here. Uh, verses 8 through 11. Again, the devil took him to the very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. Okay, so final section here of the, of the testing of Jesus, and we'll have a little more to read after this. Satan moves him one more time. Tradition holds that perhaps it was a high mountaintop near Jerusalem. Um, there is a mountaintop from there, which on a clear day, you can actually see the main highways leading to Assyria and Babylon and Egypt and Rome and Greece and all of these prominent kingdoms. So you could see roads leading to him, but you can't actually see all of those kingdoms from one spot in the Near East, which, which leads uh, all of us to agree that, that this is some sort of supernatural vision that the devil is giving Jesus, where he can see all of these mighty kingdoms, all of these powerful places. And Satan basically says, you know, I've been reigning down here for a long time, and if you bow down to me and worship me, then all of this stuff can be yours. Now, Intriguingly, one of Jesus' callings as the Messiah is to come down and break the power of Satan on earth. But here, the devil says in the Greek, using the aorist tense the way that it does, it's implying, if you come one time and bow down before me. So Satan's actually offering, you know, three to five minutes, Jesus. Just bow down and worship me for three to five minutes, and I'll stand back, and you can be king of this whole place. You can rule it. Well, that probably seemed a little bit like a shortcut. And it didn't involve getting crucified, which Jesus knew was coming. So there, was, there had to be some basic appeal to the idea of skipping past the suffering that he had. And yet, despite that, Jesus doesn't fall for it. He sees that he could skip all of that, that he could, that he could become an earthly ruler. Satan offers him that doorway, and he refuses. And once again, uh, we can see that he responds using scripture. In verse 10, it says, Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus knows it's inappropriate for him to worship anybody but God himself. That's the only person who should be worshiped. And even though that five minutes of his life might avoid a lot of pain and suffering for him, it's not right. And so he's not going to do it. 
So once again, he rebukes the devil with that. And it's interesting, uh, in one of the other Gospels, it says uh, Satan leaves and, and only to return at another time. Many people think at the passion of the testing of Jesus on the cross. But Satan leaves, and in the process, angels come to attend to him. We see some sort of peak behind the supernatural veil with this, with not only the actions of the devil himself, but, but that God is sending angels to help uphold Jesus after all of this time. In, in this era, obesity wasn't a common thing. Jesus probably didn't have a, an excess of calories that he could work off of. I think I am pretty close to being able to make it 40 days the way I've been stacking it up after the holidays. But, but for Jesus, it must have been quite testing. He's exhausted, but God comes and sends angels to help renew him so that he can continue on with his ministry, and he goes off from there. So we're going to take a minute and just read two more sections that sort of close out this section of the book. We'll stop at chapter uh, verse 22, I'll mention, and Patrick actually will be sharing the word with us next week, and he'll pick up at chapter 23 and start the Sermon on the Mount with us. But let's read verses 12 through 17 now and see what happens afterwards. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee, leaving Nazareth, and he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light, and those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light is dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, an interesting thing to note here is that here we see a transition. Jesus was in Nazareth, in this very rural area, and now he's moving over to Capernaum. And Capernaum is the biggest city that is up off of the, the Sea of Galilee. So he's now moving to a much larger urban area. And the names that we see, Zebulun and Naphtali, these were the tribes that were represented by those territories previously. It's estimated by historians now that at this point in time, probably greater than 60% of that population was actually Gentile. And so it's really interesting that as Jesus starts out his formal ministry and begins actively doing that in Capernaum, where he'll spend approximately the next year of his life, that a huge part of the people he's actually sharing the gospel with are going to be non-believers. They're going to be Gentiles. And, and yet he'll be there sharing that. And here Matthew notes, this is actually fulfilling uh, prophetic words that were said about the Messiah, that he would be here, that he would minister here, and, and sure enough, he is. In verse 17, we see what G Jesus' key message is. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is drawn near. Now, this harkens back to his baptism last week, where repentance was one of the calls. But here, Jesus knows that fundamentally things are going to change on earth. And it's not because he's going to sit on Caesar's throne. It's because he can actually sit on the throne of our hearts, that his Holy Spirit can come and change who we are, and that's on the horizon. But people need to be ready for it. Verse 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net in the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. And Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now, in the other Gospels, when we read this section, it's interesting because we get a little more detail. Jesus comes up. There's actually some crowds following him. He actually preaches a message out of the boat that Peter and his brother are using while they're repairing their nets. And we hear that they've fished all night and had no luck. And Jesus tells them to push out into the water <clears throat> and throw their nets off again. And Peter says to him, basically, Jesus, because it's you, I'll do it. But this is crazy because we fished all night and we got absolutely nothing. And they go out, they catch enough fish that the nets start to break. They actually fill both boats, uh, which we take to be the boats of the sons of Zebedee too. Both boats are overflowing to the point where they're about to sink. They come back to shore, and as they do, Peter actually says to him, Stay away from me, my Lord, for I'm a sinful man. And it's in the midst of that, when he repents, when he follows that very advice that Jesus gives, 
that Jesus then calls Peter and his brother Andrew, goes down further down the beach and sees James and John and calls them as well. I've often wondered how Zebedee, their father, felt. You know, they're out there repairing all their nets and doing all this work, and, and they must not be very far into it. And Jesus says, come with me. And these two guys get up and walk off. I wonder if he yelled back, hey, could you at least finish helping with the nets first before you go do that? But, but uh, we don't quite know that. But to the, speaking of their faith, these guys leave. An intriguing thing, I think, with James and John is that these are the last two men mentioned here uh, in this section as being recruited as disciples. And all four of these men will now be following Jesus for the next three years of his ministry. James and John are intriguing because, of course, they're brothers. And it's also interesting that Jesus, after getting this inspiration from fasting and this time of testing, goes and chooses some really ordinary people. These are fishermen. These are not the intellectual elites of their society or the wealthiest people, but they're the ones that God wants to use, as God often does. He'll often use... Uh, use those of us who you wouldn't think it would necessarily be his first choice. Um, but with James and John, it's interesting because in the history of the church, in the book of Acts, we'll read that James will actually be the first of the disciples who is martyred for his faith. He'll be the head of the early church, and he'll be executed because of that. And for John's part, John is actually the only one of the disciples who isn't ultimately martyred. Now, I will say, according to church tradition, um, John was captured, and they tried to boil him to death in a vat of oil, but he survived it. I don't know if surviving is better or not. Um, and then afterwards, he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, to this island out in the middle of the Mediterranean. And it was there, actually, around the year 95 AD that John composed the book of Revelation, the last book in the New Testament. But these two men, in effect, will bookmark the life of the church. Jesus is just received his, his calling and been sent out and been tested. And now he's coming in and he's building towards the kingdom God has actually told him to. And in the process, he's grabbed these two men who are indicative of the very beginnings of the church and the very ends of that apostolic era. John, we'll have John be the very last one. Now, what do we do with all this is a natural question that you guys might have. And what I want to point out is if you've been breathing very long, there's odds are you faced a time when you were tested, a time when things went wrong and you weren't even entirely sure what to do with it. In fact, some of you might be in that position right now. I know 2020 gave lots of opportunity for that for a lot of people. Hopefully 2021 will be a little bit different. We'll see. Um, what I want to point out here is when we face those situations, there's a lot of things that we do. Sometimes we, we go shopping online and we try to do some retail therapy to get rid of that feeling. You know, sometimes we'll, we'll look at these very temptations that Satan said. We'll try to exalt our pride and make ourselves look better. We'll try to fulfill our flesh and find things that feel good in order to get out of it. We'll, uh, we'll go on and, and look at things that look good and keep our eyes fixated on that instead. All of these different levels of temptation that were effective for Adam and Eve, and yet Jesus resisted, we're in this middle ground where we have a place to choose how we'll face it. For Jesus' part... When those things came, denying himself and filling himself with the things of God instead of the things of the world, through fasting, as an example, was a key practice. And the other key practice was actually getting to know God's word. And for Jesus' part, we don't read that he had a copy of the Bible out there. Jesus had memorized these passages. And, and I have often thought as a Christian that until we've memorized a section of scripture, we don't really own it. If you've meditated on it enough, that you can recall it from memory, then you, you, in a sense, possess that. You're ready to recall it anytime you need it, and God can use it a lot more powerfully. These are things that we have to, in season and out of, focus on if we're going to be ready. Because the reality is, as Christians, you're not promised a smooth ride with no problems. And so when these times come, we've got to focus in on God's word, on centering on it, and emptying ourselves out. And just a real quick tip um, when it comes to memorizing scripture, something that I've frequently done in the past as a tool for that is find a few passages that you know that God would like to have spoken into your life. If you're struggling with fear, find some about taking courage. And so like Joshua 1.9 would be an example. Take that, take the verse, you can handwrite it or print it out, put it in your wallet or your purse. And next time you're stuck in a line somewhere, maybe you're at the fast food chain and Lyle's moving really slow, maybe you're at the doctor's office, whatever the case may be, Pull that out and work to memorize it. See if you can say it from memory. And if not, 
Look at it a few times and just keep working, trying to repeat it to yourself. I know people who have memorized, you know, books of the Bible, and they've dedicated the time to it. Nowadays, we don't, we don't give ourselves to that discipline near as much, and it's something we're missing out on. We need to be ready for those times of trial because they will come. If we want to come out on top, we have to focus on God and his word and empty ourselves of the world in the process. At this point, I'm going to ask one of our leaders to come forward and to lead us in our communion and offering meditations. I'll ask our, uh, those doing the meditation or the, the music to come forward too. As they do, I'll ask you guys to join me for a moment of prayer. Lord, I don't know what position everybody here is in today. There may be people here who have life going perfectly and can't imagine the trials on the horizon and others who are in the thick of it. Father, you know who everybody is. I pray that you would prepare our hearts because, Father, we know that we'll have times where we're tested. We don't want to go wandering around for another 40 years. We don't want to call, cause a fall in our lives or in the lives of those we love around us because we fall into these decisions. Help us, Lord, to push out the world and all the shiny things it tries to offer us and instead focus on the wholesome foundational truths that you offer us. Father, I pray that you'd help us to thirst for your word and to reject so much of the world that creeps in on us. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's name, Lord. Amen.